And both these ingredients, by the way, it's clear, affect the growth of cities. We can either make cities 21st century style and apply the best of high tech, even using down-to-earth approaches like the barefoot architects featured in By Design this week. Or we could let it all just happen as we are, with possibly dire results. Here are the choices put by Professor Saskia Sassen from Columbia University in New York. So the future of cities, let me just give you a framing thought. I think that on the one hand, we have technologies, capabilities, discoveries, piles of money literally to develop perfect cities. But of course, there is no such thing as a perfect city. On the other hand, we have masses of people who are being literally expelled from the land because the land is being bought up by foreign firms, by foreign governments, who of course have to go to the city. So besides the natural growth of the population in cities, we have people who are expelled from rural areas. Now, a lot of these people, the first stop is a shanty town. If they are lucky, it's a working shanty, a slum, you know the, the language right, that I'm using. So in, if I look at the future, I see two urban settings, and they will be, those two urban settings can happen in New York, in Shanghai, in Nairobi, in many places. And one of them is really advanced urban spaces with extraordinary technologies and capabilities. But the other one is a degraded space. Now, some of those people may be very creative, generate little businesses, have startups, because we see that in the slums. But it is a life of hardship, where getting water will be tough, getting electricity will be tough. So the challenge is, can we create more of a balance, not put so many resources in building the ultimate luxury urban settings and redistribute a bit so that we really have a reasonable mode of urban living. Sure, there will always be inequality, always elite spaces, but that most of the people have access to water, have access to food, etc., and that cities can in fact generate part of their own food, part of their own energy, et cetera, et cetera. And I've been very interested in understanding how the capabilities of the biosphere in the form of bacteria, algae, capturing the energy that movement produces, a whole range of things. How can we deploy those inside cities? Well, that's a sociologist's view. Professor Saskia Sassen from Columbia University in New York. She was at the AAAS. And this week, Australia played host to Green Cities, a conference in Melbourne. Our own Jan Ryan of By Design was there. Back at the AAAS, though, Anthony Wood from the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, a Brit who spent useful time at Deakin University in Geelong, shocked quite a few by citing Singapore as an ideal model. People are often quite rude about Singapore for chewing gum reasons. Why do you think it's a wonderful place? You know, in the early 90s, actually after I was in Australia, I, I went and lived in and worked in Bangkok, Kuala Lumpur, Jakarta, and Singapore was a place that I would avoid like the plague because then I was in my 20s and I found it a very restrictive environment. Now, with a wife and several children, I think if there was one place in Asia that I would be comfortable living back there, it would be Singapore. I think Singapore has had a bad rap in terms of its political system and some of the perceived restrictions on its people, but... I think actually if you go and ask most Singaporeans, most, not all, they're pretty happy with life. And, and really, I think a part of their success has been the kind of benign dictator political situation. I mean, you look at the alternative politically. Let's look, you know, is, is America functioning very well at the minute? Is your country functioning? Is my country functioning very well? So it's all right for us to sit in glass houses and throw stones saying, well, Singapore, they don't have freedom. Well, look what freedom's given us. We're, we're a broken system in many ways. Glass houses. What about tall houses? What is so special about their architecture you think is an example? Well, I think that 95% of tall buildings around the world are actually pretty bad pieces of design. I, you know, I, I, tall buildings are essential for the future against this backdrop of 180,000 people urbanizing on the planet every day, us needing to build a new city of a million people every week. We've got to densify our cities. The horizontal city is no longer sustainable. Tall buildings are one way to get that density. Not the only way, but one way against this backdrop of what's happening in China, India, Brazil, Indonesia. So I believe tall 
tall buildings are a hugely important part of the future for our continued existence on this planet. What concerns me and what inspires my statement that 95% of them are terrible is that we've kind of seemed to have subscribed to a global architecture which is homogenizing cities around the world, often denying thousands of years of vernacular architecture in these places. You look at China, look at India, look anywhere, and you will see vernacular traditions in architecture. And the, and I'm not talking about, hey, these buildings look different. The thing with vernacular architecture is that it was a product of its locale. You didn't have energy to blast in air conditioning around the space. So if you wanted ventilation, you opened a window. And, and we've thrown all that out 60, 70 years ago with the modern movement, and we've created a homogenized architecture. And the tall building's the worst culprit. You look at Sydney, look at Melbourne, or Moscow, or London, or New York, or Chicago, and the cities are becoming homogenized. Now, it upsets me in two ways. One is an aesthetic way because I travel around the world because I'm interested in the difference between places. But whether you accept that or not, it upsets me more because in doing this, we're denying the opportunity for the building to coexist in its environment. How could it look good so as not to disgust you? Well, that's why we, we could come back again to Singapore. You know, Singapore has 60-storey green walls. I have these 10 design principles of, of which future tall buildings should be based and one of them is we need to embrace vegetation into the material palette you know so somewhere like singapore is pretty blessed in terms of a, a relatively static climate that you can rely on the whole year round but you know if you look at your average tall building the architecture the expression has not progressed much in the last 70 years it's just a glass extruded box like Mies van der Rohe created in the 1950s. It's ridiculous. It's 70 years later. We live in a different challenge. The challenge is, how do we continue living on this planet? Therefore, the buildings should be permeable. They should be built out of vegetation, largely. They should have a mix of uses. They should be naturally ventilated. They should generate energy. They should generate water. They should maximize the capture of water. There's hundreds of things that they should be doing and are not. Is anyone applying any of those 10 principles? Yes, there are. <laughs> so I come back again to Singapore. You know, if you look at the pinnacle housing scheme in Singapore, that is government-built high-rise housing. Just put those words together in most Western countries, government-built high-rise housing. And people run. And people, it spells disaster. But 80% of people in Singapore live in government-built high-rise housing. And this pinnacle housing scheme is seven or eight social housing towers linked at three levels with significant urban habitat you know so you've got parks and running tracks and all manner of stuff at 40 and 60 stories up in the sky it might be 20 and 40 it doesn't really matter but it's not just singapore it's happening in other places i mean europe you know you look at the commerce bank in frankfurt 1997 norman foster architect commerce bank still largely unsurpassed in terms of an ecological tower because every single level of that building has at least a visual if not a direct physical connection with a significant sky garden they have access to natural light and natural ventilation and physical communal space now that is a model for a residential tower it's a commercial tower it's an office tower but that's a model for a residential tower because that's what's disappointing about residential towers is they don't put in the infrastructure for community to develop i.e space preferably green space so you're actually picturing something that is not only a tall building, but it's horizontal on various levels as well. So it's spreading out sideways. Absolutely. You look at almost any science fiction cinematography, city of the future. From 1929, Metropolis onwards, through Blade Runner, through Star Wars, through Sixth Sense, whatever... Almost every city that's ever been created in the future is a multi-level city. And some of these are based on dystopias, not utopias, you know, social dystopias, where you see social stratification and the rich are up in the clouds and the poor are down at, you know, scum level down on the ground. I'm not necessarily advocating that. But the reason that all these cities of the future are multi-level cities is because... It is totally nonsensical that we're going to two, three, four hundred stories without connecting these buildings. So is that ridiculous or is going travelling down 200 stories for a cigarette on your cigarette break ridiculous? Well, is it affordable? Here's a world where you've got the Chinese and others showing how you can stick one of these towers up, having modular bits and do it very, very quickly and presumably cheaply. Can you afford to have the kind of vision that you've just outlined? Well, you just hit on the number one thing there. Is it affordable? The answer is yes. And it's affordable, but it needs a completely new 
socio-political, economic way of thinking of our cities. So let me ask you this. In cities nowadays, whose responsibility are the parks, the sidewalks, the sewage infrastructure, the power networks, the roads, the, all those things? It's the city government, yeah? Whose responsibility are the buildings? It's the private developer. What I'm saying is that we need to take that two-dimensional interface of this infrastructure plus building and we need to flip it vertically so that any building is a public-private partnership and the public element invests in the infrastructure in the building together with the private. It's not without challenge, but it's pretty obvious that if you've, if you've got a city and you're not going to go horizontal because the horizontal model is unsustainable, but over the next 10 years you're going to go from 1 million to 10 million which is what we're looking at in places in China and elsewhere, then we need to recreate aspects of the ground floor to support those extra 9 million people that are going to be living in the sky. And to do that, we need to get the government and, the, and, and private industry to work together so that financially these buildings become a, a shared concern. Well, there are two buildings that I've seen which are green, and the, one of the most famous ones in North America is actually in Vancouver on the campus of uh, University of British Columbia. Another one in Brisbane in the University of Queensland, the Global Change Institute just opened, and they've got many of the elements that you describe, and they have said that they cost maybe 25% more than the standard building, but having explored ways of doing it, it'll become cheaper and cheaper as other people follow their example. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. It's, it's very simple. It's economies of scale. I mean, the first time you do anything, it's going to cost a hell of a lot more money. And history is littered with examples of great ideas that didn't work, perhaps because of their implementation or marketing that were brought back. You know, it wasn't that long ago, maybe 20 years ago, someone actually created a tablet computer that flopped, totally flopped. And it took Steve Jobs to bring the development of the app. So it's the same with building technology. It might be 25 percent more expensive to have created that particular building at Brisbane. But once you create the second and the third and the fourth, and actually, really, the real question becomes, can you afford not to? You know, at the minute, and this is going to sound melodramatic, but at the minute, we are still in a period of choice with sustainability, a period of choice. That means we can still choose whether to turn up or down our air conditioning, get in our car or not, use recycled bags. We are in a, still in an element of choice and everybody is making that choice. We are rapidly moving towards a plane of survival. You know, you've seen it in Brisbane, you've seen it in Christchurch, you've seen it in London now. I mean, I, I checked the news the other day, three things. Bushfires in Australia, flooding in the south of England, unprecedented storms on the east coast of America. One morning, you know, we're rapidly getting to where it's no longer going to be down to choice, but survival. Then the economics change fundamentally. In the investigations you're doing, do you include how people can live in these new surroundings, up in the sky, going horizontally and so on? I mean, it, would it be a drastic change for us to be up there? I think it would be a drastic change. And by the way, you know, I, I, we're not suggesting here that Sydney's got to pack in its suburbs all the way to the Blue Mountains and everyone's got to load up their car for a one-time journey into a dense city. And, you know, we, in America, we're projected a 0.9% per annum population growth. And these people that are moving to America, partly through immigration, partly through population rate, they don't want to live in Detroit. You know, they want to live in the Sunbelt cities. So what we're seeing is, you know, Dallas is projected for a 52,000 people per year population growth for the next few years. That's a significant number. It ain't quite what's happening in China, but it's a significant number. And so we do need to densify those cities. And in doing so, I think there is a fear oh, well, we've got to pack up our single family home, you know, and we've got to find a whole new way of living. Well, look at Seoul, Hong Kong, Singapore, and many other cities in Asia where they've been living that way for 30, 40 years. And, and actually, if you look at statistically, Singaporeans enjoy a higher standard of life than most Western nations. And if you meet a Singaporean, you know, somehow they've managed to make this transition. And I think that's the thing. It's no longer going to be an element of choice. It's going to be an element of survival. And we don't yet know what we need to do. If as a matter of our continued existence on this planet, more people need to start living on smaller plots of land, I think we got away with it lightly. Getting away with it now, maybe not much longer without applying some real vision 
Anthony Wood is Executive Director at the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, and he's also an Associate Professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology. He was at the AAAS. And there's much more on some of these ideas, like vertical gardens and agriculture, coming up in Off Track. That's on Saturdays after this program at 1 o'clock, and on Sundays at 6.30 in the morning on RN. Off Track is presented by Ann Jones. Next week on The Science Show, we go into space and do some experiments on that space station. Why is zero gravity important? You'll be surprised. And also visit San Diego Zoo to feed some pandas. Meanwhile, don't forget Gold and the Incas, still astounding visitors to the National Gallery in Canberra. It's on until April the 21st. Production today by David Fisher and Lila Shunner. I'm Robin Williams.